Okay, so today we're going to carry on with this series on essentially the ancient Hebrew wedding model, and today we're going to look at the bride. Uh, there's lots of teachings on the bride of Messiah, um, so let's uh, get stuck in. Um, there's actually much confusion in regards to the identity of the bride. You can tell this because there's varied opinions on who the bride is. Now, Christianity believes that all believers are the bride. If you believe in Messiah, that's it, you're the bride. You've got your golden ticket, as it were. So that's one riverbank. The Torah side believe that they are the bride, but that the Christians are not, because they keep the commandments. So we have like a polar opposite thing. Even within the Torah movement, there's like a division on do the Christians get in, do they not, not realizing that they're actually passing sentence on people even though that's not their place they're usurping the role of messiah we're called to inspect fruit not to pass sentence today we'll be showing about the traits and characteristics of the bride i'm not going to tell you who the bride is again that's not my job i'm not knowledgeable righteous and uh, omnipotent only Messiah and the Father get to, well, it's the Father that decides who the bride is for the Son. So today, I'm not going to tell you whether you're the bride or not. This is where I think a lot of teaching already gets it wrong. They try to say, well, we're the bride. We're, you know, we're the Philadelphians, right? You get this mentality. To, all I'm going to show you is what Scripture says about the bride. And then you can go out and work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's look at some of the shadows we've been given to try and ascertain what we can about the Bride of Messiah. There's a surprising amount in there if you just dig. So let's start in Genesis 24. And Avraham was old, advanced in years, and Yah had blessed Avraham in every way. And Avraham said to the oldest servant in his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh. So that I make you swear by Yah, the Elohim of the heavens and the Elohim of the earth, that you do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but go to my land and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Yitzchak. We're not going to read the whole story. We know the story, all right? I'm not going to bore you with the, with the milk, so to speak. Now, there's several main characters to this story. There is Avraham the father. There's Yitzchak, which is the son and the groom. There's Rivka, the bride, or the bride-to-be at this stage. And then there's Avraham's servant. Now, we touched on this a little bit, I think it was in the last teaching or the previous one to that. Um, what's interesting about this story is that in the story of the choosing of a bride for Yitzchak, not once is the servant named He's just called Abraham's servant, the servant. We only know of his identity because of other passages. So in Genesis 24, it just says, Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house. And throughout this story, he's just called Abraham's servant. But if you go early in Genesis, before Abraham was Abraham, it says, and Abraham said, Master Yah, what would you give to me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So from this, we can infer that the servant that was seeking out the bride for Yitzhak was Eliezer, Abraham's most trusted servant. Now, I mentioned this last week, that this is a beautiful type and shadow of how we know that Yeshua has gone back to be with the Father. And who have we got now? What have we got now dealing with us? We have the Spirit, yeah, the Ruach. And here we have a beautiful type and shadow of the servant going out to find a bride for the Son. It's, it's amazing when you dig into it. Eliezer, the nameless servant, is a picture of the Ruach HaKodesh. Now, in John 15, 26, this is Yeshua speaking. When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of the truth, who comes from the Father, he shall bear witness of me. Now, this is exactly what uh, Abraham's servant did. This is Abraham's servant speaking to uh, Laban, Levan, and uh, Rivka's family. And he said, 
I am Abraham's servant, and Yah has blessed my master exceedingly, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given to him all that he has. He's bearing witness of his master and of the, the groom. Now, note what he says. He has given to him all all that he has. We get echoes of this in John. The father loves the son and has given all into his hands. John 13, verse 3, Yeshua, knowing that the father had given all into his hands and that he had come from Elohim and was going to Elohim, rose up from supper and laid aside his garments and having taken a towel, he girded himself. Again, just that in itself is a beautiful type and shadow of Messiah lowering himself, becoming a man, and girding himself with sweat, as it were. John 16, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he shall guide you into all the truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he shall speak. And he shall announce to you what is to come. This is exactly what Eliezer did. He didn't speak of himself once. If you read the account... Um, they, they go to sit down and have a meal. And what does Eliezer do? He goes, hold it. Let me state why I'm here. Let me state my mission before I even sit down and eat. It wasn't about him. He was witnessing of him who'd sent him. He shall esteem me, for he shall take of what is mine and announce it to you. All that the Father has is mine. This is, that is why I said that he takes from what is mine and announces it to you. I love the parallels between Yeshua's words and Genesis 24. So let's go back to the story. We've just read this, uh, the beginning of Genesis chapter 24. Let's keep digging. In the story, who was the bride? In that story, Genesis 24. Rivka, Rivka right, Rebecca. Where did the bride come from? From, okay, the father's house. Who's the father? Abraham, yeah. Where did they live? What, what, which is? Babylon. Right, so we're getting there. She came from the father's family. She didn't come from the nations. She didn't come from the pagans. She was of the father's house. Now, if we're being built into a spiritual house, right? Peter speaks about this. Paul, Paul speaks about this. We as living stones built up into a spiritual house. That family was in Babylon. So where are we right now, guys, right? We're in the Babylon of this world. She was called out of Babylon. So it's interesting that you have the father's house in Babylon and the bride is selected from that group of people. This is important because the bride was not the totality of the family. Yitzhak didn't marry the whole family, which is, I say this because, again, Christianity says that all believers are the bride. Again, the, 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 as we're going to see, the bride is called out of a people, hence the title of today's teaching. She was chosen from a group of people. Elohim, let's take this type in shadow. We see this everywhere of Yah choosing a group of people out from something. He selected Yisrael as his people from all the nations. In Deuteronomy 32, this is the song of Moshe. It says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the B'nai Elohim. We've gone through this before. Like the modern translations will say, according to the children of Yisrael. This is not what the Septuagint or the Dead Sea Scrolls say. It says, according to the sons of God. I think the ISV might have got this one right. But this is speaking of the divine council. Um, I would highly recommend Michael Heiser's book, The Unseen Realm. Uh, it's a separate teaching in of itself. But Yah gave the nations over to the rule of other lower G gods. But that's a different topic. So he divided the nations according to the people, uh, according to the number of the B'nai Elohim, 
For the portion of Yah is his people, Yaakov, his allotted inheritance. So on an, even on like a national scale, Yah select, I, I'm choosing these guys. These are now set apart unto me. From the 12 tribes, he selected the tribe of Levi to serve the priests in his tabernacle. We get this in Numbers 8, verse 19. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aharon and to his sons from among the children of Israel to do the service of the children of Israel in the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the children of Israel that there be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near to the set-apart place. So he selects a group of people to serve the priests. Now we know that from the tribe of Levi, he selects the seed of Aharon to be the priests. In Exodus 28, verse 41, it says, you shall put them, uh, the garments, the priestly garments, on Aharon your brother and on his sons with him and shall anoint them and shall ordain them and shall set them apart and they shall serve as priests to me. What's interesting is who had access where? within the tabernacle. So here's a picture of the tabernacle. Uh, I took it last week, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so this courtyard here, the courtyard here, who was, was the public allowed in the courtyard? Actually they were. How, how was the public allowed into the courtyard? That they had to wash their, they had to be washed first. When, when did the public come to the courtyard? To give a sacrifice. Now there was protocol to do that. I can see you guys smiling at the square tabernacle. Another topic. Um, but the public were allowed only in special occasions when they brought a sacrifice. Now to, before they even did that, they would have had to wash themselves. They would have had to immerse themselves so that they could be ritually clean. Then they would bring the animal, lay their hands on it, and they would have to kill it. And then the priest takes the blood and sets it all up. Now, are the Levites allowed in this little section in the courtyard? Yes. They serve the priests, okay? But they, they're allowed in it. Uh, they've got a greater amount of freedom within the courtyard than, say, a regular person bringing a sacrifice. The person bringing a sacrifice would have had to stay here at the gate. They, wouldn't, they would have brought the animal, done the killing, and they wouldn't have been allowed further than the altar at the, very, at the most. Okay, so obviously the priests are allowed in the courtyard. They're the priests. Let's go to the next section, the holy place. Not the Holy of Holies, the holy place. Are the Levites allowed in there? Well, I'm not asking about the priests. Are the Levites allowed in the holy place? No, they're not. There's only one specific time that the Levites are allowed in that place, and that's when they were packing down and setting up. And to do that, they had to be under strict supervision of the priests. The priests had to go in and cover everything up because the Levites weren't even allowed to look at the holy objects, were they? If you, if you study your Torah, they were not even allowed to look upon the ark or to look upon the... It had to be covered by the priests and then the Levites were allowed to go in and carry burdens. But generally speaking, the Levites are not allowed in the sanctuary. They're allowed in the courtyard. Only the priests were allowed in this section. So again, we have this selecting from a selecting from a selecting. And obviously, the most holy place, everyone knows, only the high priest once a year. The high priest, a foreshadow of our Messiah, Yeshua. So let's keep going with this. In the parable of the wedding feast, there are three groups of people. The servants, the guests, and the bride and groom. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the way the tabernacle was set out is, very, is it marries up perfectly to the bridal arrangement, the wedding arrangement. The servants are just that, servants. They're, they're employed almost by the head of the house. 
Um, I'm, again, I'm going to use myself as an example. When Ruth and I got married, I had people there that served. Now, what's really interesting, as I was thinking about this, I didn't deal with all the servants. I only dealt with the head servant. There was this woman, she, ran the, she did all the wedding planning and all that, but I only dealt with her, nobody else. Uh, and the head barman, he gave me free drinks, right? That's important. But it, again... <laughs> But the point I'm trying to make is already we see authority structure and we see levels of intimacy. I only dealt with the head servant and she had to deal with everybody else. I don't want to know what they're doing behind the scenes. I just want my wedding to go smooth. There were guests and these guests are the friends of the bride and groom. I, some of you were there at my wedding. I invited you because I love you and you are my friends. Now, you are far more intimate with me than the servants who were there. Even the barman, right? And the bride is very special to the groom. Again, another level of intimacy that the, the, the friends of the groom do not have. The same principle of this applies today. It, it was the same in ancient times. It's still the same today. John 15 this is my command, says Yeshua, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that one should lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all which I heard from my father I have made known to you. At my wedding, the servants didn't know what I was doing. They had to talk to the head servant. Now, my friends who were there, they knew they had a copy of the, of the wedding, how things were going to go down. Now, here, this is Yeshua speaking to his disciples. He's, this is the night before he's about to be crucified. So we see even the disciples, they've gone from servant to now being friends. There's this intimacy Knowing what the groom is doing means we are his friends. This is what Yeshua says, right? You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. I call you my friends, sorry, servants. You are no longer servants because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing, which implies a friend does. What is it that tells us what the groom is doing and specifically when? What have we been given to tell us what the groom is doing and when. Uh, something in the word, something we do, something we celebrate. The feasts, the appointed times. The appointed times tell us what our master, what our groom is doing and when. Right, when did he die? Pesach, when was he buried? Day one of unleavened bread, or in time for. When did he rise? First fruits. When was the spirit, the gift from the groom to the bride given? Shavuot. We're now waiting for the last three. Now, we did this in the earlier parts of this teaching that we can ascertain that trumpets is when the groom will come to fetch his bride. Atonement is when he will consummate with his bride, and then we have the wedding feast. We know what our groom is doing. And when? Think about that. This is amazing. This is why it annoys me when people treat the feast very flippantly and casually. Exodus 31, 13. And you speak to the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths, plural, you are to guard by all means, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations to know that I, Yah, am setting you apart. Those that were invited to my wedding feast were set apart from everybody else. There were other people I knew that I did not invite. You, people were set apart. The Moedima rehearsals for the wedding, the greatest wedding that will ever occur, that of Messiah and his bride. The Torah, now listen to this, the Torah and the feasts do not guarantee for you to be the bride. They just make you friends of the groom. Can people see that? You're just a friend. If you have, say, if you have knowledge of his word and you have knowledge of his feasts, you're invited, you're called to the wedding. 
This will make more sense as we keep going. But are the friends the bride? No, this is, the bride has a deeper, more intimate connection. Okay, Matthew 22. The reign of the heavens is like a man, a sovereign, who made a wedding feast for his son. And when the sovereign came in to view the guests, he saw there a man who had not put on a wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, we know what is the wedding garment? What in Revelation, it tells us that the white garments are the garments of righteousness. Then the sovereign said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, throw him out to the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The guests had to have the garments of righteousness. Now, what is righteousness as per Torah? It's the Torah, it's the feast, it's all these things. The Torah tells us what is right and what is wrong. So having knowledge of Torah, doing Torah and doing the feasts, that just means that you're invited to the wedding feast. It doesn't make you the bride. For many are called, but few are chosen. Even the guests had to have the correct attire. Now, in an ancient Hebrew wedding, and this is still done in modern, um, in, in the more Judeo side, what color are the wedding garments? White. Again, clean white linen, the righteousness of the saints. The guests had to be righteous. Now, if you're righteous, I, I think it's easy to assume you're doing the feast. You know what the groom is doing. Having white garments of righteousness does not guarantee you being the bride. It makes you a friend of the groom. Again, Christianity would say, just believe. Just believe in Messiah. Have a mental ascent. You're the bride. That's not what scripture teaches. Unfortunately, well, <laughs> the garments of righteousness are required to even be invited to the wedding feast. You can, you, I can invite someone and they can turn that invitation down. Everyone has been invited. You sure holds his hand out, right, right? I stand at the door and knock. The invitation has been sent out. It's up to us whether we accept that invitation and prepare ourselves for said wedding. Revelation 7. And this I looked and I saw. And after this, I looked and saw a great crowd which no one was able to count out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb dressed in white robes and palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Deliverance belongs to our Elohim who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, which Moed, which appointed time is this? It's Sukkot. Now, what did we say Sukkot is a type and shadow of? The wedding feast. So what's occurring here, right now? The wedding supper of the Lamb. The attendants are dressed in white robes. Let's keep moving forward. Now, what does one have to dwell in at this time of year? A tabernacle, a sukkah, a booth. I want to suggest that the sukkah is a type and shadow of the marital of where the consummation occurred. It's intimacy. It's a tabernacle. Now, who dwells in the tabernacle, right? Yah, himself. Let's keep going with this passage. And one of the elders responded, saying to me, saying, who are these dressed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, these are those coming out of the great distress, the great tribulation, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim and they serve him day and night in his dwelling place. Who got to serve in the dwelling place? We just covered it. The priests The priests were allowed in the holy place, not the Levites. Levites were allowed in the outer court to serve in the outer court. They weren't allowed to do the showbread, to do the incense, to set... um... Anyway, you get what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, well, they were dead. They were dead. So these people serve 
in the dwelling place. This is priestly language here, actually. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tent over them. Again, like we covered this in earlier parts, this idea of spreading your skirt over someone was the man taking the woman in. Now, what's really interesting, if you look at the Greek for shall spread his tent over, it's used in one other place, and that's John 1, when the word put on flesh and dwelt amongst us. It's the same language. These are the guests to the wedding. They wear white robes, and they're allowed in the tabernacle. They're allowed in, not, they've moved from the outer court to the holy place. These are like the priests of the tabernacle. Both wear white robes, right? What does a priest wear? White linen. What did you wear at a wedding? White linen. Psalm 132, verses 8. Arise, O Yah, to your place of rest, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests put on righteousness and your kind ones shout for joy. Only these people get to be inside the tabernacle. Only those with white robes that are righteous and know what the master is doing are allowed to the wedding feast. Only these get to be part of the wedding. Everybody, people that are not, you, you might get to watch it on the outside, but we'll get to that. Revelation 19, and I heard as the voice of a great crowd, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunders, saying, Hallelujah, for Yah El Shaddai reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife prepared herself. And to her it was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the set-apart ones. Again, let's take the Christian viewpoint that everybody's the bride. Where are the guests? Where are your witnesses? You need two witnesses, right? To make sure that two or three, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is confirmed. <laughs> and he said to me, right, blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says that they've been called to it. It doesn't say there's a bride and there's people called to it. And he said to me, these are the true words of Elohim. So let's take this back, all of this, to Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast, that the reign of the heavens is like a man. The, the king throws a big wedding banquet for his feast, uh, for his son, and there's someone without the proper garb. Many are called, few are chosen. Those that have been called to the wedding supper of the lamb are not the bride, they are the guests. The bride is there. Like, it's all about the groom and the bride, especially the groom. The guests have to have the white garments of righteousness. The guests have to be friends with the groom. Okay, everyone with me so far? Does that, does that make sense? We're going to look at this idea. We're going to go back now to how Yah selects a people out from a group. And in those days it came to be that he went out of the mountain to pray and was spending the night in prayer to Elohim. And when it became day, he called near his taught ones and chose from them twelve, whom he also named emissaries. So Yeshua, he, he, he already had a following before he called the twelve. The twelve apostles were called out from his taught ones. They were called out. Three of those were brought closer to a deeper intimacy than the other 12. We see this written throughout the, the scriptures. Mark chapter 5, verse 35. As he was speaking, they came from the ruler of the congregation's house, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But having heard the word that was spoken, Yeshua said to the ruler of the congregation, do not be afraid, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Kephar, Yaakov, and Yohanan, the brother of Yaakov, Peter, James, and John. Only they were allowed into the house to view the miracle take place. Those closer to Yeshua got to witness things the others didn't. The others, okay, they would have known about it, but these three guys would have seen it with their own eyes. 
They would have seen it. They were privied to something that the others were not. Mark 13. And as he went out of the set apart place, one of his taught ones said to him, Teacher, see what stones and what buildings. And Yeshua answering said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another at all, which shall not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, opposite the set-apart place, Kephar and Yaakov and Yohanan and Andri asked him separately. See, we think this is all the disciples, but it was actually those that were close to him. Say to us, when shall these events be? And what shall be the sign when all, these, all this is going to be accomplished? Those closer to Yeshua were privy to revelation, others were not. It was those that were closest, and you should have said, you know what, I'll tell you. you know, there's certain things that I've said to you guys in private that I will not say from behind this mic. And I'm not even talking about me, just things to do with the word, because I know you, I know your walk, I know where you're at, and I know that you know, some things, certain people are just not ready to hit. But you guys, because you walk with me, you... I get to share things with you that I wouldn't feel comfortable sharing behind this mic publicly. It's the same here. Mark 9, verse 2. And after six days, Yeshua took Kephar and Yaakov and Yohanan and led them up on a high mountain alone by themselves. And he was transformed before them. And his garments became glittering, exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launder on earth is able to whiten. Those closer to Yeshua got to see a glorious side of him that the others didn't. They got to see a particular aspect of Messiah that they were privy to it. Everybody will see him at the end, but they, got, they were allowed to see the first fruits of it, as it were. They got a deeper and fuller understanding of him. Mark 14. And when they came to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his taught one, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Kephar, Yaakov, and Yohanan, and he began to be greatly amazed and to be deeply distressed. And he said to them, my being is exceedingly grieved, even to death, stay here and watch. Those closer to Yeshua got to see a vulnerable side of him that others didn't. Those that I'm closer with, it, it, this happens socially. People that you're closer to, you, uh, you take away that sort of social mask. You, make it, you put yourself in a vulnerable position. They had the honour to share in his burden as well. There's, you know, you're not going to share your burdens and all your woes and troubles with you know, Tom, Dick and Harry down the street. You'll do it with people you're walking in close fellowship with. You know, th this is actually the beauty of marriage. A marriage, you should be able... Everyone wears this social mask. And whenever you interact, you, you, it's a fact. Everyone hides behind this sort of like, this persona, this mask, I call it. And with those closer, you reveal, you, you lift more and more of it up. With husband and wife, they shouldn't be one. This is what it means to be one. We've done this before in the discipleship teaching. The levels of intimacy, the levels of discipleship. So... Imagine this is a tree, and the very, outer, the, the very outer core of the tree, this is the 120. So this is uh, internet land. We have fellowship. People have fellowship on Facebook, on YouTube, on teachings, and this represents the very outer ring of the tree. The next stage in is the 70. You know, you sure sent out 70, two by two. Um, now, this is maybe like a wider feast gathering or even like a large Shabbat gathering. Um, again, there's, because you're in this social situation, you have that kind of level of barricade almost, that social mask. Now we get to the 12. This is what Yeshua patterned. This is what Yeshua showed us. And this is when you start walking together daily and sharing in each other's burdens and... Look, guys, in men's discipleship, we're starting to get close. It's starting to get intimate. People are starting to share, to put themselves in a vulnerable place where they open up to people. Then we have the three. This is what we've just seen. Yeshua had his 12 disciples, and from them he took three. 
and they got to see something more. It's the same with, with just in our group. Some of you will be more drawn to other people. It's just inevitable. And then there's the core, two become one. There's marriage, and then there's that relationship we, we strive to have with our creator. So th these are like your tree rings, as it were. Now, here's discipleship. In international, the internet, we have the wider gathering, then the 12, then the three, then marriage. The core of the tree has been bored out by the enemy. Um, so, what we ha so basically, discipleship is under account or, uh, attack, or we have pseudo-discipleship. Things dressed up as discipleship, but it's not. Uh, hopefully, you guys are starting to see that there's a difference to what we do to just general what's out there. The three, because there's no true discipleship occurring, well, you haven't got this occurring, the three. People don't trust each other enough. And what is the enemy attacking in society right now? Marriage, the family, the core. So what we have is a tree with a hollow. And does a hollow tree bear good fruit? I would argue, does it even bear fruit at all? What happens when you have a diseased tree and the, the core like it's eaten on the inside? You chop it down. Thus, no true discipleship occurs. We stay in the socially safe zone. Okay, so sometimes what happens now in wider fellowships on both sides of the riverbank is that people stay behind this mask. I've said this before to you guys that you'll only get out of discipleship what you put into it. If you want to come to discipleship and you don't start putting into it, and what I mean by that is if you don't start sharing in each other's burdens, if you don't start opening up, you're not going to get any benefit from it. You know, Jez, I'm going to use you as an example, but even before we made official, the official men's group, Jez and I went through a journey, you know, and we, we went on, a, you know, a journey of doctrine and this, but in the process of that, there was this intimacy that occurred. And I got to see a side of Jez that maybe other people wouldn't. And he saw a side of me that I don't, you know, generally publicly display. But this was because we chose to submit to one another. You're not going to get anything out of discipleship if you don't submit into it. Okay, let's now take this to the camp. So the, the layout of the camp we have. So the internet, let's start from the marriage, it's easier actually. The high priest gets to go into the Holy of Holies. The priests got to go in the holy place. The Levites were stopped at the court where the laver and the altar was. And outside of that, you had the tribes and the mixed multitude. In the analogy of the camp, if we have a bored out tree, that means we don't have a functioning priesthood in, in the type and shadow. Because we don't have this occurring, the 12, the 3, and the marriage. We don't have this going on if we're, we're putting it across to that. This means that we do not have judges, because this is what the priests functioned as. They were, they were to judge between matters. The result of which is everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Look around. The general body, what is everyone doing? What is right as they see fit? This also means that we do not have a means of drawing near to Elohim to be intimate with him in the type and shadow. The, the priesthood was how people drew near. Now, what I'm saying is that because we don't have a lot of true discipleship going on, we don't have a lot of heart circumcision going on. We don't have people being refined. Let's remember which group of people was allowed into which part of the tabernacle. What we have is a load of people in, in, in the Facebook land, YouTube land, and if they're lucky, a bit of fellowship, wider fellowship, but then they, they do this. They put their guard up. There's no intimacy. This is one of the things I love about this fellowship is that we're intimate with one another. We, we have a good crack. You know, the fellowship out, outside of the teaching time to me is just as important sometimes more important than this. Okay, let's now apply this to the wedding. 
parable. We have the bride, which is the high priest, which is marriage. We have the guests, which are the priests. We covered how the priests uh, wear white garments. They're allowed into the tabernacle. The Levites are the servants. The, outer, the court, what do you have outside in the parable? Outer darkness. If the center of the tree has been bored out, this means that we are actually robbed of becoming servants, then friends, then the bride. We don't even get to come into the courtyard of the tabernacle. You get to be a whitewashed tomb. Where does that put the majority of the believing world? <laughs> so, it, it literally puts them in outer darkness. Oh, oh, Michael, outer darkness is hell. We'll cover that. How much do you value discipleship now? Again, you get out of it what you put into it. Okay, I mentioned this outer darkness thing. Let's kind of tackle this. Cultural idioms. Many details can be lost in translation, right? Everyone knows that. Many erroneous thoughts and even doctrines can stem from a lack of understanding of culture and its idioms. You know, look at modern Western Christianity. Let's unpack two of these idioms because they're directly related to the wedding feast. That is, throw him into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what's the common doctrine on these two statements? What's the common doctrine? Hell. They're out in hell, they're burning and they're weeping and gnashing because they're burning in hell. And it sucks, right? And that's the common doctrine out there. I'm going to suggest that that's not the case. Let's look at outer darkness. The Greek for outer darkness is toskotos to exoteron. Now, skotos literally means just shadow or darkness. Pretty straightforward. Exoteros, which is where exoteron comes from, means outside place, something outside of something. This phrase is actually more accurately rendered as the darkness further away, implying places with lesser illumination than those closer in. Does that make sense? So you have... Uh, the, the, the analogy is that you have a house, you have light in the house, and outside of that is darkness. The phrase outer darkness occurs 23 times in the Septuagint and is always in relation to the tabernacle or temple of God or the palace of the king. And you've got some references there that you can go look at in the Septuagint. Most significantly, the term is used 15 times in Ezekiel to describe the outer court of the temple. So the word outer, exoteros, this is the word that's used. Now, when we did the millennial temple teaching back at Sukkot, and I was, did I cover it there? I don't think I did. But it's, the majority of this usage is in relation actually to the millennial temple. It once describes the outer gates of the temple as well. You had a, a perimeter outside and you had outer gates. That same thing used. The predominant usage of this phrase speaks of being outside Elohim's temple, i.e. the place of light, you know, yards in there, the light, especially in context of the millennial temple. Now, this is fascinating because when Yeshua says that those that will be cast out of the wedding feast will be cast out into outer darkness there's this inference that it's outside the place of light. You can't get hell out of this unless you put it into the text, is what I'm saying. Let's remember the Septuagint, right? It was translated by Hebrews who understood the Torah and they chose to use this word and it just happens to be the word that was used in the New Testament. Matthew 22. And he says, so let's go back to this parable of the wedding feast. Friend, how did you not come in here having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the sovereign said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, throw him out into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Throw him out. That's all it says. Into outer darkness. Now, Parallel this to the parable of the ten virgins. And later the other maidens also came saying, Master, Master, open up for us. And he says, sorry, I don't know you. Now we mentioned this. Were the virgins in the camp? 
Yes. So are you now going to tell me that the foolish virgins are now burning in hell, even though they're in the camp, right? It doesn't make sense. But he answering said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Now, when did wedding feasts take place? At night. This means that the feast was greatly illuminated by torches. When the groom used to come to fetch his bride, there would be torches. How else do you get into through the night? And how did the bride come out? She had an oil lamp and she would watch for that. You know, she would hear the shofar first and she'd right, the groom is coming. And then she would see the light off in the distance and she'd go out and walk towards it. Outside of the feast is outer darkness. That's literally all it says. Cast him out into outer darkness. Kick him out the wedding. When he said, I don't know you, that because you friends. Well, they weren't his friends. Yeah, if I don't know you, you're not my friend. Why would I invite you to my wedding if I don't know you? I can assure you, everyone at my wedding, my wife and myself knew. The people in outer darkness have been forcibly prevented from entering the wedding feast. Hence what we read in Revelation. Blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're blessed. They get to share in something far more intimate. Let's look at weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is another idiom that is poorly understood, right? They're they're weeping and gnashing their teeth because they're burning in hell. Weeping and gnashing of teeth doesn't refer to the torment of eternal damnation. Again, go back to the culture, put it back into context. Um, It's an idiom that can imply extreme disappointment. Uh, It can be of grief and mourning. When you're grieving, you would weep and gnash your teeth. Of anger. If If you're angry, you gnash your teeth. In the Tanakh, particularly in Proverbs... Uh, gnashing of teeth is used of wicked people that gnash their teeth at the righteous. So this idea that, um, you know, le shon hara is linked to this, uh, slander. It's used, you know, when Stephen gives that beautiful oratory and not long before the Pharisees kill him. If you read it, it says they were pierced to the heart and they gnashed their teeth at him because of what he said. He says, you know, you always resist the spirit. Were they burning in hell? No. We, gnashing the teeth is extreme emotion, whether it be anger, grief, or disappointment. And he was going through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Master, are there few who are being saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow gates, because many, I say to you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Master, Master, open up for us, he shall answer to you and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Then you shall begin to say, but we ate and drank in your presence and you tore in our street. But he shall say, I say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of unrighteousness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you, now, this is key. When you see Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov and all the prophets in the reign of Elohim and you yourselves thrown outside. We'll, we'll tackle this, the reign of Elohim in a second. And they shall come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and sit down in the reign of Elohim. What do we read in Isaiah of the Torah shall go forth from Jerusalem and the nations shall go and to Jerusalem to learn. You have the nations coming in from east and west and north to go to Jerusalem to learn. Are they burning in hell? No. And see, there are last who shall be first and there are first who shall be last. This is why they weep and gnash their teeth. The weeping and gnashing of teeth is from extreme disappointment. They're mourning the fact. It comes from being angry at oneself. They did not do enough when they had the chance to be part of that wedding feast. This one's really, this one's amazing. Luke 8, and the captain, this is the Roman centurion, said, Master, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only say a word and my servant shall be healed. 
For I too am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Yeshua heard, he marveled and said to those who followed, Truly I say to you, not even in Yisrael I have found such great belief, such great faith. And I say to you that many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov in the reign of the heavens. But the sons of the reign, this is speaking of Jews now, he's speaking to blood, Israel, blood Jews, shall be cast out into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yeshua is implying that the Roman centurion is worthy of the intimate place of light, while some of the Jews are not. A Roman was showing... The Jews were given the oracles of right. Uh, well, Israel was given the oracles, but then Israel was cast off. So we, we just had the southern kingdom, Judah, left, that were guarding... Well, they put lots of stuff around the Torah, but... They were supposed to have the oracles and to be teachers. Oh, I've probably got the chapter wrong then. Those people excluded will weep and gnash their teeth. You mean a goy? Because this, is, this would have been their mindset. You're telling me that a dog, a Gentile, is going to get in the kingdom before me. But I'm under rabbi blah, blah, blah. Don't you know? And they will weep and gnash their teeth. Now, you've got to tie this back to Isaiah and the prophecies of the nations coming to Jerusalem, to Israel. Now, this was all based on the centurion's faith, by the way. Again, it's faith. Let's put this back to Matthew 25. Therefore, so this is the parable of the talents, right? We know the parable. Um, Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to him who possesses ten talents. For to everyone who possesses, more shall be given, and he shall have overflowingly. But him who does not possess, even what he possesses, shall be taken away. And throw the worthless servant out into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We know that the worthless servant has not been thrown in hell when you compare this passage to the parallel passage in the other gospel. In Luke 19, it says this, And the first came, saying, Master, your mina, your talent, has earned me ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you were trustworthy in a small matter, have authority over ten cities. Now remember, who's ruling with Messiah in the kingdom to come? The bride. Who do you think is going to be helping rule? And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. And he said to him also, and you be over five cities. And the other, the, another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I laid up in a handkerchief. And then this is what the owner says to him. You know, he buries it. He, you know, Why did you not put the silver in the bank that when I come, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those who stood by, take the mina away from him and give it to him who possesses ten minas. This is the judgment of one's works. They're being judged for what they did. Paul speaks of this. Shaul. 1 Corinthians 3. For no one is able to lay on any other foundation except that which is laid, which is Yeshua Messiah. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work shall be revealed, for the day shall show it up, because it is revealed by fire. And the fire shall prove the work of each one what sort it is. If anyone's work remains, which he is built on, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself be saved, but as through fire. There's people, that are going to end, there's people that are going to enter the kingdom with many riches, where, you know, lay up treasures where moth, rust, do not destroy. There's going to be others that walk into that kingdom with nothing. We see a pecking order occurring. These passages all show the same thing. Rewards for those who did well, losses for those who didn't. Throw the servant outside of my house. You no longer get to be part of my household is what he's saying. 
those thrown out into the outer darkness lost the reward of being in the intimate spaces of Elohim, hence them weeping and gnashing their teeth. They lost the reward of ruling and reigning with Messiah. Not everyone will rule and reign. They fell short of these verses. Revelation 3, he who overcomes, I shall make him a supporting post in the dwelling place of my Elohim, and he shall by no means go out. And I shall write on him the name of my Elohim, the name of the city of my Elohim, the re renewed re Yerushalayim, which comes down out of the heaven from my Elohim and my renewed name. Not everyone gets to hang out in the tabernacle, in the millennial kingdom. Revelation 7, and one of the elders, we covered this, responded saying to me, who are these dressed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, these are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Because of this, they are before the throne of Elohim and serve him day and night. They shall be priests. Not everyone gets to be a priest. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tent over them. Okay, let's look at the millennial kingdom just quickly. Will there be other nations than Yisrael in the millennium? Yes. Okay. Which nation shall rule the world? Israel. All 12 tribes. Isaiah 61, and the strangers, the nations, shall, feed, shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called priests of Yah, servants of our Elohim shall be said of you. You shall consume the strength of the Gentiles and boast in their esteem. Will all of Yisrael be ruling and reigning with Messiah? It's a trick question. <laughs> I heard a no, good. Not all of Israel will be ruling and reigning. They'll be part of the kingdom that's ruling and reigning. Right now, we're in England. Is everyone in the House of Commons? No, is everyone ruling and reigning? No, some of us are just going about our business within the country. Look, Ezekiel 45, 17, this is really interesting. And on the prince are the burnt offerings. We did this at Sukkot. And the grain offerings and the drink offerings and the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbaths, all in the appointed times of the house of Israel, he is to prepare the sin offering and the grain offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make atonement for the house of Israel. That tells you that not all of Israel will be immortal. Who gets to rule with Messiah? Those that have put on incorruption. We know there's going to be mortals in, in the millennial reign. That one's easy to spot. But this is telling you that some of the house of Israel still needs atonement. If, you're, if, you've, if you've got a glorified body, you no longer need atonement. Yeah. But the, people think that the millennium reign is the grand finale. The, the, the millennial reign is just the first fruits of what is going to be, you know, the olam haba, the world to come. Because after that, everyone, right, it's a foretaste. Those cast out into outer darkness will weep and gnash their teeth because they have been excluded from the wedding feast of the Lamb. The point I'm trying to say is that outer darkness is outside the kingdom. We, we did this. Uh, who remembers when... We show the division of the land in the millennium. Ezekiel around 47 shows you how did Israel cover the whole world? No, it didn't even have the full land allocation that Abraham had. Which means that there's other people outside this kingdom. What I want to suggest is that outer darkness is outside of that. It's, at the very least, it's outside the, the nation of what will be real Israel. But I'm going to go one step further and say that, there'll be, again, there will be mortal Israelites, which means, I'm sorry, I can't see a mortal Israelite in the, the temple precinct, in the sanctuary at the wedding. They will weep and gnash their teeth because they have been excluded from the citizenship of the kingdom of Israel. They will mourn and be angry at themselves for not doing enough in this life. 
I'll even argue that they may be angry at Elohim's judgment. You know when a parent says, right, that's it, and you're like, oh, but that's so unfair. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bit of that going on. And he carried me away into the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the set-apart Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from Elohim. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the sovereigns of the earth bring their esteem to it. These are people that are walking in the light. They're not in outer darkness. And its gates shall not be shut at all by day or night, for night shall not be there. And they shall bring the esteem and the appreciation of the Gentiles, of the nations, into it. And there shall be no means any enter into it, whatever is unclean, neither anyone doing abomination and falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Again, not everyone will be allowed in the renewed Jerusalem. And see, I am coming speedily, and my reward is with me to give each one according to his work. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life and to enter through the gates into the city. We just read that the gates will be open. They will never be shut, but yet there will be people who are not allowed in. But outside are the dogs and those who enchant with drugs and those who whore and the murderers and the idolaters and all who love and do falsehood. Let's take a break here. I hope, like, I know that this may kind of stir the pot a bit, so to speak. You know, I remember when I first came across the weeping and gnashing of teeth those years back, I was like, my goodness, this really changes it up. But it gives us... We just have warped views of, you know, what our faith is telling us. Amen. Okay, Um, let's tackle the second half of today's teaching. So far, so in the first half, we looked at how the bride of Elohim is called out from his people. There's a selection process Um, The bride is not the totality of his people. She is selected out from his people. Now we're going to look at actually the traits and characteristics of the bride. Like I said at the beginning of part one, we're not going to say who the bride is and who it isn't. We're just going to show traits. What does she do? What is it that our king is looking for specifically from his bride? other than the obvious, i.e. white garments of righteousness. So let's go back to Genesis 24. And the servant took ten of his master's camels. So this is Eliezer, Avraham's eldest servant, took ten of his master's camels and left, for all his master's good gifts were in his hand. And he arose and went to Aram Naharaim, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a fountain of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, Ya Elohim of my master Avraham, please cause her to meet before me this day and show kindness to my master Avraham. So the ten camels are made to kneel by the servant at a well at a fountain of water. Right? That's the shadow picture. The language and the shadow gives us a really interesting thing. The word to kneel is barach. It means to bless or to kneel. It can be used both ways. So this idea that by kneeling comes blessing. Um, Now the root for the word, which the word for fountain comes from, is ba'ach, which means to make plain, to make clear, to declare or letters on a tablet, but this idea of um, almost pulling the veil off, making something uh, that is hard to understand clear. So the ten camels have been led by the servant, which is a picture of the spirit of the Ruach, to kneel, to obey and be blessed at the water. Now, the word is the water of life. Yeshua is the water of life of the fountain, the place where the word is made plain and clear. 
So the ten camels have been led by the Spirit to be obe- to obey and be blessed by the Torah, which is and the Torah is where the word is made plain and clear through the servant. Who are the ten camels? The ten tribes. Ten is always usually referring to the northern kingdom. The ten lost tribes, I've put it, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, what is occurring right now? I would argue that the lost sheep are waking up. They're being led by the Spirit back to the front end of the book. And they're starting to understand something that was now made no sense. You now get great joy. I mean, who remembers reading Leviticus and being like, man, I, I just don't get it. Now I read it. So that's amazing. When you see the types and shadows, when, they've, when it's all elucidated. The test for the bride is to see if she will provide water from the well to the ten lost tribes. This idea of serving. I'm not talking about just teaching here. This is not our, let's all praise the teachers. Everyone has a function, you know, um, being that support for someone can be like life-giving water, if that makes sense. Let's keep going. The servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little from your jar. And she said, drink, my master. And she hurried and let the jar down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, she now offers of her own free will... Let me draw water for your camels too until they have finished drinking. Now, a thirsty camel can drink up to 25 gallons of water in one sitting. That's 114 litres of water. Eliezer had 10 camels. So, 1,000 litres of water. Now, where does the water come from? The well. This was hard work. You should see the jars they had, these big things. It was hard work. And she offered this of her own free will. She wasn't even asked to do this. (laughs) That is quite some kindness shown on the behalf of Rebecca. The bride has to be eager to quench the thirst of the lost tribes. However that takes place. And she hurried and emptied her jar into the trough, ran back. She runs back. She doesn't even drag her feet. I mean, she's going for it. Uh, a lot of men, inverted comma, these days wouldn't even be able to do that. She ran back to the fountain to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the watching her, the man remained silent in order to know whether Yah had prospered his way or not. And it came to be when the camels had finished drinking that, a man took, that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for a wrist weighing ten shekels of gold and said, whose daughter are you? Please inform me, is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milka's son, whom she bore to Nahor. And she said to him, we have both straw and fodder enough and room to spend the night. So now she's showing hospitality, which is, uh, uh, hospitality is always linked to Abraham. And the man bowed his head and worshipped Yah. Not only is the bride eager to serve and water the camels, she is ready to show hospitability to the servant. This idea of welcoming someone. And she said to him, this is how she shows hospitality. We have provision, come, come and eat, come and rest. What what, what does Yeshua say, right? Come and uh, rest in me. She displays the same characteristics of her groom. Remember uh, when we were talking about silver and how silver is refined and you knew it was ready when the smith would be able to see his own reflection in it. You, the, Yeshua should be able to look into his bride and see his own characteristics. Now, in Matthew 25, we know this, uh, the sheep and the goats. Then the sovereign shall say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the rain prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. This is exactly what she did. She clo- well, she watered him, she gave him rest, she gave him food. 
Ya Elohim of my master Abraham, please cause her to meet before me this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Doing this for the servant is the same as doing it unto the master. Remember, the servant came in the authority of Abraham. So when, a, when someone went out in the name of the king, you were speaking to the king. You may as well be dealing with the king himself. Now, I know this is speaking of Yah showing kindness to Abraham, but I, I was thinking about this and I was like, her doing this to the servant is showing kindness to Abraham, to his seed. Does that make sense? Because the servant came in the authority of Abraham. Like someone coming in the authority of the king, she may as well be blessing Abraham. She's respecting that authority and blessing him by blessing his envoy, as it were. What was the servant a picture of? The spirit. Now, whose spirit is it? It's Yah's spirit. It's Yah dealing with you, not some... Anyway, let's not get into a Godhead debate. Then the righteous shall answer him, saying, Master, when did we see you hungry and we fed you, or thirsty and gave you to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and we came to you? And the sovereign shall answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, in so far as you did it to the one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it unto me. I'd never connected this story to the sheep and the goats. And it's, I think it's just so beautiful. How does the bride bring forth water? In this particular story, how did she do it? She, yeah, she did it herself. She... As the verse says, she hurried, she let her jar down to her hand and gave him a drink and she hurried and emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the fountain and she drew for all his camels. The point I'm trying to get out of this is that the water was brought forth by action. She didn't just believe that the camels would drink themselves, right? It wasn't a mental ascent. Torah is something you do, you don't just know it. This shows that Torah is brought forth by action and not by words and belief only. As James says, so also belief, if it does not have works, is in itself dead. This also implies that you have to work to get the water of life. Now, it says um, in Scripture that it's to the glory of Yah to conceal a matter and to the honour of kings to, to seek it out. You have to put, do you just get revelations just like that? No, you have to seek. You have to seek and knock and pray. And then you have to show that you're thirsty and show that you're willing. Then he'll give you the waters of life. And he said, Ya Elohim of my master Abraham, please cause her to meet before me this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Why is this kindness important? It's because it's a key characteristic of Yah. Ruth showed this, and he blessed, and he said, Blessed are you of Yah, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, not to go after young men, whether poor or rich. In Joshua, uh, this is uh, Rahab, and now please swear to me by Yah, since I have shown you kindness, that you also show kindness to my father's house and shall give me a true token. Now, the story of Rahab is another beautiful type and shadow. What was Rahab? Her profession. She was a whore, right? Where did she live? A pagan land. Where are we right now? In pagan lands. What have we been guilty of? Spiritual adultery, harlotry. And by showing kindness to his servant, she was saved from the destruction I mean, if there isn't a clear type and shadow of us being brought out of Egypt, as it were, out of spiritual harlotry and being saved, but she did something. She didn't just believe. Her belief was manifested by her action. She put her life on the line, by the way. If she would have been busted harboring the spies, she would have, you know, it wouldn't have been a pretty way out either. And Yah came down in the cloud and stood with him there. This is when Moshe sees Yah on the mountain and he proclaimed the name Yah. And Yah passed before him and proclaimed Yehovah, Yehovah, an El compassionate and showing favor, patient and great 
in kindness, chesed. We're to show kindness like him. It's a key attribute of him. It's linked to covenant. Watching over kindness for thousands, forgiving crookedness and transgression and sin, but by no means leaving unpunished, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The bride will show this attribute. She will be like her creator. She will be like her husband. The bride will be like her husband and show the exact same attributes. In John 13, this is the example our master gave us. Before the festival of the Passover, so it's telling you when this was, uh, just for like timings. People say that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. This is before the Passover. Yeshua, knowing that his hour had come, that he should move out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper taking place, the devil having already put it into the heart of Yehuda from Keriot of Shimon to deliver him up. Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all into his hands and that he had come from Elohim and was going to Elohim, rose from supper and laid aside his garments and having taken a towel, he girded himself. After that, he put water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the taught ones and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This was the lowest servant's job. You had ranks within the servants. This was the lowest servant's job. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and master and you say, well, for I am. Then if I, master and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is an emissary greater than he who sent him. If you know these teachings, blessed are you if you do them. Leadership in Elohim's kingdom serves the wider body. It's not an authority thing, it's a serving thing. The bride will rule with her husband. Like him, she will lead by example, by serving, not by lording it over them and doing Nicolaitanism. Who then is a trustworthy and wise servant in whom his master set over his household to give them food in season? If you look at the Greek, it's in this idea of an appointed time. In a Moedim, decided feeding at the appointed times. I love the imagery. Blessed is the servant whom his master, having come, shall find so doing. Truly I say to you that he shall set him over all his possessions. So the servant that is feeding the other servants and looking after them and in due season at their appointed time will be rewarded. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming... And begins to beat his fellow servants to eat and drink with the drunkards. Bit of Torah terrorism going on there, maybe. The master of that servant shall come on a day when he does not expect it. At an hour he does not know. And shall cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a stern warning to leadership. All round. However, it should also be a source of great comfort to those who are serving and found so doing. You can, you know, which side of the judgment are you going to be on? Jeremiah 3. Go and proclaim these words towards the north. Who got scattered to the north? Ten tribes. Return, O backsliding Yisrael. The one that got divorced declares, Yah, I shall not look on you in displeasure, for I am kind, declares Yah, and I do not bear a grudge forever. Only acknowledge your crookedness, because you have transgressed against Yah, your Elohim, and have scattered your ways to strangers under every green tree, and you have not obeyed my voice, declares Yah. Return, O backsliding children, declares Yah, for I shall rule over you, and shall take you one from a city two from a clan, and shall bring you to Zion. Don't be surprised that this walk is lonely. He literally says you are being called one from a city, two from a clan. That's like few, a remnant maybe? 
and I shall give you shepherds according to my heart, and they shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is what was foreshadowed by Rivka in the watering of the camels. Do you see the parallel? Yara's prophet, Jeremiah's prophesying that Yah's going to bring people to feed the, the backsliding children. We're the backsliding children, guys. That's us. Well done us. And he's going to anoint and appoint people like Rebecca, that they will kneel at the fountains of water where they can drink the water of life, where it can be made clear to them. <sighs> can people connect it? Same people, same themes. Nothing is new under the sun, right? There is another book that gives some insights into the bride and some of her characteristics and traits. Who can guess it? Yeah, that, people like to go there. Book of Esther. Book of Esther is a clear type and shadow, as we're going to see. Let's look at some of the insights we can glean. This is interesting because actually Purim is coming up, so it's interesting timing. After these events, when the wrath of sovereign Ahasuerus, so we know what happened, he, he, brought Vash, he, he summoned Queen Vashti and she didn't come, so he casts her off and like, does away with her. After his wrath had ceased, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and what had been decreed against her. Then the sovereign servants who attended him said, let lovely young maidens be sought for the sovereign and let the sovereign appoint officers in all of the provinces of his reign and let them gather all the lovely young maidens of the citadel to the citadel of Shushan in the women's quarters under the hand of Haggai, the sovereign's eunuch, guardian of the women, to give their preparation. So already we're seeing a group of people being drawn out from within a kingdom. The bride will be a maiden. She will be a maiden. Not a widow, not a whore, a maiden. As Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a jealousy according to Elohim, for I gave you in marriage to one husband to present you as an innocent maiden to Messiah. This is why dying unto self, crucifying the flesh, and baptism is so important, because you get to kill that whore, to be raised anew, a spiritual virgin. So first of all, the bride will be a virgin, spiritually. And let the young woman who pleases the sovereign be sovereigness instead of Vashti. And the word pleased the sovereign, and he did so. The bride will be pleasing to the king. Again, this is another thing we've got out of Christianity, that you cannot please Yah. Your righteousness is as filthy rags, right? That old mantra. Our righteousness is... But he gives us his righteousness, he's given us his Torah, he's given us his spirit to write that Torah on our hearts, to become like, that's pleasing to him. I, I find this very humbling, actually, that the king will find pleasure in his wife. Zephaniah 3.16, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, do not let your hands be weak. Yah, your Elohim, is in your midst, is mighty to save. He rejoices over you with joy. He is silent in his love. He rejoices over you with singing. I shall gather those who grieve about the appointed place who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Let's keep going. In the citadel of Shushan, there was a certain man, a Yehudite, whose name was Mordecai, son of Yair, son of Shimi, son of Kish, a Binyamite, who had been exiled from Jerusalem with the captives who had been exiled with Yekonia, sovereign of Yehuda, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the sovereign of Babel, had exiled. The bride will come from exile. Where are we? We're in exile. We're literally watching this Deuteronomy 30 being fulfilled right now in front of us. And it shall be when all these words shall come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, you shall bring them to your heart among all the Gentiles where Yah your Elohim drives you. And you shall turn back to Yah your Elohim and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. The Torah was, this is when Moses was speaking. What was being commanded that day? Torah. With all your heart, with all your being, you and your children. This is speaking of a scattered people keeping Torah in the nations. 
Then, Yah, your Elohim, shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Yah, your Elohim, has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heavens, from there Yah your Elohim does gather you, and from there he does take you. And Yah your Elohim shall bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he shall do good to you, and increase you more than your fathers. For Yah turns back to rejoice over you, for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of Yah your Elohim, if you obey to guard his commands and his laws, which are written in this book of the Torah. Not the systematic theology of Charles Finney. This book of the Torah. If you turn back to Yahya Elohim with all your heart and with all your being. Again, like I've said this in a previous teaching when people say, oh, we don't get enough signs and wonders and you're watching this being fulfilled. Why isn't that enough? You're actually a part of it. Let's go back to Esther. And it came to be that he was raising Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and of good appearance. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. And it came to be when the sovereign's command and decree were heard that and when many young women were gathered in the citadel of Shushan into the hand of Haggai that Esther too was taken to the sovereign's palace into the hand of Haggai, guardian of the women. And the young woman pleased him. She pleased the servant and she received kindness from him. So he hastened to give her preparations and her portions and gave her seven choice female servants from the sovereign's palace. And he moved her and her female servants to the best place in the house of the women. Now, when, so th- this is amazing because she, f- she finds favor wherever she goes. And when the turn of each woman came to go into, the, into sovereign Ahasuerus, after she had completed 12 months according to the regulations for the women, for the days of their preparation were completed as follows. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and with the preparations of women. Thus prepared, the young woman went to the sovereign and whatever she asked for was given to take with her from the house of the women to the sovereign's palace. The bride will have gone through a rigorous purification process before she even gets to go. She had to undergo six months of oil of myrrh and then six months of perfume. I mean, talk about a spa day, right? A spa year. Before she could even be summoned in the presence. This is purification. What's myrrh associated with? There's two things that... The bride has died unto self. Only then will she be presentable before the king. You've got a period of time dying unto self. Then you've got a period of time being, you know, on working. Because once you've died to self, you're not a finished product, right? You need to learn. You need to grow. (laughs) I just love the imagery. The other thing myrrh is associated with, it was a compound of the, of the incense that was put on the altar of incense. It was one of the main compounds, myrrh and cinnamon. So you've got this idea of intimacy, the prayers being heard in the tabernacle right before the Holy of Holies through death of self. We have an amazing typology occurring here. We have the king wanting a bride. So the king of the nation, the king of the kingdom, I want a bride. He sends his servant to do this. The the servant went and did it. This is exactly the same as what happened with Rebecca. The servant went out. What is Yah walking on earth right now? No, who's doing the selecting of the bride? The servant, the spirit of truth. The bride is prepared and purified under the supervision of the servant. Do you, are you going through the purification process? Is the, is the Ruach guiding you through that? She finds favour with the servant and ultimately with the king. Revelation 19, let us be glad and rejoice and give him praise for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife prepared herself. 
And to her it was given to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the set-apart ones. And when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Avichail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to come into the sovereign, she sought no matter but what Haggai, the the sovereign's eunuch, guardian of the women, advised. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. So we read in the previous verse that when the women were to be presented before the king, they were allowed to take something of choice with them, like a gift. Or Now, she doesn't, this is amazing. She asks the servant, what should I take to please my king? Bring it back to the type and shadow. Don't just turn up in front of Yah willy-nilly with, oh, well, I'm going to bring this. A futile offering. Have you asked the spirit, what does my king want? Seek him. What does he want from you? That's a beautiful thing of the bride. She'll, she'll, she's got this relationship. And Esther was taken to sovereign Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the munch of Tevet in the seventh year of his reign. And the sovereign loved Esther more than all the women, and she found favor and kindness in his eyes more than all the maidens, and he set the royal crown upon her head and made her sovereigness instead of Vashti. And the sovereign made a great feast. Does it ring a bell? (laughs) Great feast. The feast of Esther for all his officials and servants. And he proclaimed a release in the provinces and gave gifts according to the means of a sovereign. The the typology is so clear. This is revelation right now playing out. A type and shadow of it. The bride has been chosen. She's been crowned. It's time to feast. Thus begins Sukkot. Let's look at this. The king proclaimed the release in the provinces and gave gifts according to the means of a sovereign. There's, what release are we told of in scripture? A release of the Jubilee. The Jubilee, he proclaimed the release in the provinces. Now let's dig deeper. There's actually an amazing hidden truth hidden in this statement other than the Jubilee. This is a quote from uh, my cross-referencing thing, the treasury of scripture knowledge. It says, we learn from Herodotus in Athens that the Persian monarchs were accustomed to give their wives distinct cities and provinces for the purpose of supplying them with different articles of dress. Because back then you had particular places, they they would uh, have a particular product. Like, so leather is good here, there's good myrrh here. Do Do you see what I mean? One was assigned for ornamenting the head and the neck. Another provided robes, zones, etc. And the city of Anthela was given to the Persian queen, we read, to supply her with shoes and sandals. So every city had a particular wear to offer the queen. It is probable, therefore, that at the desire of Esther, Ahasuerus relieved those cities and provinces that had before paid it from this expense. So, like, you don't get, you have to know the, the culture. The queen's honorary clothing and possessions came from other cities and countries under the king's command. Remember, Persia was an empire. It was huge. Now, don't we read of this in prophecy that Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, shall go to them. In Isaiah 60, arise, shine, for your light has come. And the esteem of Yah has risen upon you. For look, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness of the peoples. But Yah arises over you and his esteem is seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to your light and sovereigns to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. All of them have gathered. They have come to you. Your sons from afar and your daughters are supported on the side. Then you shall see and be bright and your heart shall throb and swell. For the wealth of the sea is turned to you and the riches of the Gentiles come to you. A stream of camels cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all those from Shiva come bearing gold and incense, proclaiming the praises of Yah. 
All the flocks of Kedar are gathered to you. The rams of Nevaiot serve you. They come up for acceptance on my altar, and I embellish my esteemed house. Again, a type and shadow. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Again, where do you want to end up in the kingdom? Do you want to be served and rule by service? Or, again, this hierarchy. But you shall be called priests of Yah. Servants of our Elohim shall be said of you, and you shall consume the strength of the nations and boast in their esteem. Instead of your shame and reproach, they rejoice a second time in their portion. Therefore, take possession a second time in their land. Everlasting joy is theirs. Not only that, the king himself will deck out his bride. We just read that the, he assigned cities to give particular things to the queen. But then we read in Esther how he says, no more, I myself will give you gifts. Again, this is written of. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed Yah has blessed. I greatly rejoice in Yah, my being exalts in my Elohim, for he has put on garments of deliverance on me. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Should have found that much favor that not only will the nations give gifts, but Yah himself will give gifts. Revelation 2, and to the messenger of the assembly in Smyrna write, this says the first and the last who became dead and came to life, be trustworthy until death and I shall give you the crown of life. He will give the bride that crown of life. See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I shall come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I shall give to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The invitation has been sent out. The, that right there is the invitation to, will you be my betrothed? Once you are my betrothed, will you work on your garment preparations? Will you let the Ruach work on you? Will you go through the purification process? Will you be submerged with myrrh, die unto self, to then be purified and made pleasing to your king so that then you can consummate and be queen and sit on his throne with him? Amen.